Good morning. How you doing? Good. Are you a little more tired than you were yesterday at this time? Some of you uh, need a nap, and uh, hopefully you get one of those today. Well, I want to welcome all of our campuses uh, and those of you online, a few extras online today, this morning, and uh, it is good to join together as one church. I want to, uh, before I jump into the message, highlight the impact report that, did you guys receive this this week in the mail? Many of you received the impact report. Well, if you gave this past year financially to Vineyard Columbus, uh, you will get, if you haven't already gotten this impact report, unless you gave anonymously, which you can do that, of course. Uh, But if you gave, if you text to gave, or if you gave online, then you got this impact report. I want to draw your attention to a couple of things or a couple of messages that you need to hear as you take a look at that impact report. The first is we have so much to celebrate as a church with what God has done this past year. Let me just highlight Uh, a few things. Uh, First of all, you guys are inviting folks to church and folks are coming. This past year, we had more visitors to the church than we had in any year in the last 10 prior years, which is really encouraging. This past year, there were over 850 folks that made a commitment or a recommitment to Christ and let us know about that through, through uh, you know, just writing their name down or texting us or reaching out to a pastor. We have over 350 folks that were baptized, 350 new members who, are, who have joined the church this past year. And, and not just, you know, the church is growing, but the impact that you church are having in our community You serve this year through our food pantry over a quarter of a million meals to those who are in need. It's an incredible number, a quarter of a million meals to folks in our city who were in need. Over 600 moms who were in unplanned pregnancies were served through Vineyard Columbus. 500 internationals joined our ESL program and are learning English. We launched a new campus for our Hispanic community here in the city. And our church supports over two dozen missionary families in 24 different countries around the world. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. There is so much for us to celebrate and thank God for. And and the second message that I want you to hear is that we want you to pray about how you can continue to invest in this church, not just through prayer, not just through serving, but also through your giving. Uh, One of the things that Uh, Despite all of our numbers going up, the numbers of folks that we're serving, the numbers of folks coming into the church, one number is going down, and that is our giving. Now, why is that? Why is our giving going down? Well, one of the big reasons for that is uh, those who founded this church, the boomer generation, are now entering into retirement and have less disposable income than, uh, than they did before. And so it is really incumbent upon us, those who are younger, those Gen Xers, millennials, Gen Z, to step in and to make this church yours and to step into giving. And so what we want to ask you to do is to just prayerfully consider again at this point in the year, God, what would you have me do to invest in your kingdom through Vineyard Columbus? And if you're not tithing, I want to ask you to move toward a tithe. If you're already giving, I want to ask you to tithe. All of our leaders give at least a tenth to the the kingdom of God through this church. And I want to ask you and challenge you, if you're not already, to follow our example. Church, there is so much more that God wants to do. So much more. 
and I want to ask you to continue to invest. And I want to thank you for the ways that you're already investing. Well, I want to jump into the message. Last month, Elon Musk tweeted this, will not be surprising to you. We are mapping out a game plan to get a million people to Mars. <laughs> that, that was my response. Like, wow. I mean, the guy, you can't fault him for having big vision, right? A million people to Mars. And uh, the crazy thing is people are responding like, that's awesome. I love it. You know, sign me up. Like it's going to Disneyland. I mean, it is insane when you think about what it would be like to actually go to Mars. Did you know that uh, about 10 years ago, there was, uh, there was uh, a study done uh, called the Mars 500. And what they did is they took a handful of people and they took them out of their normal daily lives and they put them in this little module, this little ship, spaceship looking thing. And they made them live for 520 days. And they tested, what is it like for you to experience deprivation of all kinds? Relational deprivation and sleep deprivation and nutrient deprivation. And, and what they found is that uh, I don't want to go to Mars. It's not good. It's not good. You know, people were losing sleep and their bodies were deteriorating and physically they were experiencing the, the effects of, of uh, just a loss of exercise and, and nutrients. And, and just think about, you know, like when I lose an hour of sleep a night, like when I took this job as senior pastor here, I didn't know that it came with sleepless nights. But all of a sudden, I, I just couldn't sleep. I was up like every night. And I'm like, why God, why? I'm a terrible human to be with when I lose a little bit of sleep, right? And so are you. Or imagine, you know, just sleeping, uh, not just sleeping, but drinking out of one of those little pouches to get your nutrients, right? Like ice cream out of a pouch. How wonderful, it's so nice. Or imagine what they had to go through with the distance that you had to, uh, you know, relate with your family. They, they, ha they made them wait 20 minutes to receive a message from the outside world because apparently that's how long it will take once you're close to Mars. 20 minutes to receive a tiny little message from the outside world. Now think about, uh, when you get a message from someone on your iPhone and, uh, and, the, and you don't immediately reply to them. And they looking at their phone and they don't see like the little bubbles appear, right? And they're mad at you like, why are you taking so long to reply to me? It's 20 minutes there, 20 minutes back. And, and what they found was that sleep deprivation and nutrients deprivation and and the lack of connection impacts us. Well, why is that relevant today? Well, we're gonna continue in this series called I Believe on the Apostles' Creed. And today we're coming to a line that says, I believe in the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that I think is true of many Christians today is that we are deprived in a way of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Well, what do I mean by that? Now, if you're a Christian, every Christian has the Holy Spirit. We know that. The Word of God tells us that each and every one of us, once we become a follower of Christ, we receive the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit, but all too often, it's like we go into one of those space modules every day and we live in a sort of Holy Spirit deprivation. And so many Christians aren't taught, how do you live and walk with the Holy Spirit? How do you hear the voice of the Spirit? How do you stay uh, deeply connected to life in the Holy Spirit? And so many of us are deprived of, 
uh, the fullness of life in God or, or to flip it upside down, think about a time when you were so full of the spirit. You remember just God's presence with you. And maybe you remember just hearing his voice. Maybe you remember responding to his promptings and his leadings. And, and you had f- so much faith and you were witnessing and you had this boldness in your life because God was there, his presence was there. Well, today as we take a look at the Holy Spirit, Uh, What I pray and what I want for each one of us is to be filled and for our church to be filled, for us to be alive in the Holy Spirit. So would you pray with me and let's ask for more of God. Lord, we do pray that you would come and fill us today. I pray, Lord, a refreshing wave of your spirit in our lives. I pray, God, that where we have been uh, just deprived in ways of your spirit, God, where we haven't learned to walk with you, or God, where we've just lost you along the way, I pray, Spirit of God, that you would come and, Lord, you would return to us and you would fill us again. And, Lord, I pray your life in us, your life in this church, God. Lord, We have nothing apart from you. Lord, you are all that we need. And I pray, God, that you would come and and do a work in us and fill us again. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we've been working our way through the Apostles' Creed. And it confesses, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And from there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. And then this, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Well, let's begin with who is the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit shows up around 500 times throughout the Bible, and there are a number of different ways that the Spirit is revealed. First of all, the Holy Spirit is, unsurprisingly, the Holy Spirit is spirit. It's a spirit. The Hebrew word that is used for spirit is the word ruach. And uh, the Greek word is the word pneuma. And both of these words mean spirit, but not just spirit. They also mean wind or breath. Sometimes they're uh, life, wind, breath. You see this all the way at the very opening of the Bible in Genesis 1. The ruach of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God, the ruach of God, or the wind from God, was hovering over the water. So from the opening words of scripture, we see that the Holy Spirit is a spirit, not just a spirit, but a life-giving spirit, a life-sustaining spirit, the spirit that breathes over all of creation and indeed over your life. But the Holy Spirit isn't just a spirit. The Holy Spirit is also a person. Uh, The question is not what is the Holy Spirit, but who is the Holy Spirit? Because throughout the scriptures, the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force Uh, It's not like the force in Star Wars. The Holy Spirit is a person. And over and over again throughout the scriptures, we see the Holy Spirit acting as a person. So you see the Spirit leads as a person leads. The Spirit prays like a person. The Spirit knows. The Spirit decides. The Spirit assists. The Spirit teaches, loves. The Spirit relates. 
The spirit leads, the spirit speaks. These are all things that a person does. The spirit is a person, not an impersonal force. It's not the the universe that's blessing you. It's not karma. It's a person, the person of the Holy Spirit that comes to bless your life. A person who loves you, a person who has a purpose for you, a person who gives you meaning. The Holy Spirit is a person and the Holy Spirit is holy. It's the Holy Spirit. And what that means is that the Spirit is not a person in all of the ways that you and I are persons, right? Uh, The Holy Spirit is holy. And what that means is Uh, The word holy means to be distinct, to be other, to be completely different. And it's this otherness, this difference of the Holy Spirit that, as Jesus said, comes and convicts us of our sin, which is a gargantuan task, isn't it? At least for me it is at least for me, to convict us. I mean, why else would we have an experience of guilt? Why? It's unnecessary apart from something that is coming and holding up a mirror into our lives. You see, the Holy Spirit is not an echo communicating our own voice back to us. The Holy Spirit is coming and communicating something different to us. He's a Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is also God. God. The word Trinity doesn't explicitly appear anywhere until the second and third centuries. And so some of you might be surprised at that. You think, well, that's one of the things I know about Christians is they believe in the Trinity. And why is it until the second or third century that it doesn't show up? Well, you know, the the scriptures don't unpack in a treatise, clearly define the the work of the Holy Spirit and who the Holy Spirit is. You're not going to find that in the scriptures, but you see it implicitly all through different places in the New Testament. So, for example, you see the Trinity in Jesus' baptism. In Matthew 3, it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized... He went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him, and then a voice from heaven, the Father, saying, this is my Son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. You see it also at the end of Jesus' ministry, the Great Commission, therefore and go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And you see it in the letters in the New Testament. So you see this triune declaration in the very last words of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Christians confess that God is Trinity. Now, it's come with a lot of misunderstanding and critique, this doctrine of the Trinity, especially from people of other faiths, from Muslims or Jews. And and they look at Christians and they say, well, you're not really monotheists. You don't believe in one God, you believe in three gods. It's very clear, that's what you say. You believe in the Trinity. But Christians have always maintained that we believe in one God existing in three persons, sharing the same being, the same substance, as it were, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's one of two mysteries of the Christian faith, two paradoxes, if you will, that should never be resolved. As soon as you resolve them, it becomes a heresy. And the first one is, what is the nature of Jesus? And the second is, what is the nature of God? And in answer to the first question, what is the nature of Jesus? Christians have always said, Jesus Christ is 
fully God and fully human, one Lord, our Messiah. And in response to, well, who is God? Christians have always said, uh, Christians believe in one God, the triune God, existing in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are two doctrines that don't add up mathematically. You can't say, well, uh, Jesus is fully God and fully human. One plus one equals two. No, it's one plus one equals one. And the same with the Trinity. It's not one plus one plus one equals three. It's one plus one plus one equals one. That's what Christians have held and believed. And, and Christians have always tried to understand and explain this mystery and, and uh, use all kinds of analogies. And they all kind of fall apart, but we try in different ways. And let me just share one image with you that was developed a thousand years ago. It's called the, uh, the Shield of the Trinity. It's a diagram to help folks understand each person of the Trinity and how they relate to one another. And, and essentially what it's saying is that yeah, the Spirit is not the Father and the Father is not the Son and the Son is not the Spirit, but each of them is God. That is what Christians believe. And I see some of you looking at that and saying, I'd love to get that tattooed on my arm. And uh, yeah, you can do that. It's better than the meaningless tattoos. My son, he bought a tattoo gun on Amazon and he and his friends doodle on themselves tattoos. So this is better than that. So if you're gonna pick, pick this, it's much better. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to throw you under the bus with that. He loves me, he'll forgive me. Um, What is more important throughout scriptures than understanding uh, completely, which is impossible, the nature of the Trinity or even the Holy Spirit is that we are filled with the Spirit. So much more important to the writers of scripture then understanding is that you experience the Holy Spirit, that we don't have anemic lives, that we're not deprived of life in the Spirit. This is what is of utmost importance, is that we are filled with this life from God, knowing this life from God. Now, why is it that we need more of the Spirit? Let me just share three ways We need more of the Spirit to be more like Jesus, do we not? We need more of the Spirit to be more like Jesus. You see, we're not just meant to be more like ourselves. We're meant to be more like Christ. The writer of Ephesians, Paul, says this, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things. There is no law since we live by the Spirit. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. And basically what he's saying is, if you want more of the worst parts of yourself then don't seek more of the Spirit. If you want to be more of a jerk, more selfish, more unloving, more unkind, more angry against other drivers who cut you off, then don't seek more of the Spirit. But if you believe that there is something better, if you think there's something more, if you think that being a Christian is to reach into likeness with Christ, then man, We better be seeking more of the Spirit because there's no way that we become more like Christ without seeking His Spirit. It doesn't happen. Now, unfortunately, we think it does happen just out of our own good nature. Um, You know, I think of an apple tree that's planted in an apple orchard. 
And uh, an apple tree in an apple orchard is perfectly cultivated. It's well watered. The sun is perfectly shining. And uh, they're, they're sprayed against worms and all of the things that would harm it. And therefore it produces great fruit. We think that we live in an apple orchard that is like that, but that is not most of our lives. It's easy to like be kind when someone is really kind to you, right? It's easy to be kind until you're up all night with a crying baby. It's easy to be loving when somebody gives you a hug and is like, you're amazing. But when your relationship is on the rocks, it's like another thing, right? And this is true for most of our lives. Our lives are not planted in an apple orchard. They're planted in like the reality of this broken and sinful and sometimes very dark world that we live in. And I think when we hear about the fruit of the spirit, we need to be thinking about what is the worst and darkest place of my life? The darkest, most difficult place of my life. What is that place? And is there fruit from God's spirit growing there? What would that look like? Let me share with you an extreme example that we Time, from time to time, face extreme examples in our life. Let me share one extreme example with you. Last week, uh, this past week, during the week, I went into our bookstore. Uh, our, our bookstore manager said, Eric, I want you to see something here at our Westerville campus. And he brought me in and he said he set up these tables and there were just pieces of blank paper on the tables and he, and he had these signs there with a pen and there were just questions where you can anonymously just write an answer. And one of the questions was, where do you experience empathy in your life? And there's a woman in our congregation who wrote this about a current reality in her life. And she said, I feel empathy for the man who killed my son through gun violence. And then she described her experience of empathy. When I saw him for the first time in the courtroom for sentencing, I felt sadness for him. He was like a broken person who had been throw, thrown away, a throwaway person. Friends, Imagine that. Like when I read that, I was so cut to the heart. Because I think about myself in a situation like that. What would the tree of my life produce if it were planted in that situation? And apart from the Holy Spirit, it would be like, no way. No way could I have that kind of response of empathy, of sadness, of experiencing some heartbreak towards someone else who did something so dark and so evil to a loved one who is so dear and close to them. And friends, I think about places of our lives. I think about places of my life where I've had to do the hard work of forgiving. I think about some of the places of your lives where I know what you're walking through and apart from the Holy Spirit, there is no way. There's no way apart from God. And so I want to encourage us, wherever the darkest, most difficult place in your life is, would you pray for more of the Holy Spirit? We need the Spirit to become like Christ. We need the Holy Spirit to be empowered to serve. The first tree is a fruit tree. The second tree I want you to think about is a Christmas tree. I want you to think about the gifts of the Spirit. We move from an image of the fruit of the Spirit to the gifts of the Spirit. 
the, the idea, the picture that comes to my mind is of a Christmas tree, this time with presents all around it. That tree didn't do anything to grow those presents. There is nothing that earned those presents. There is nothing that produced those presents from that tree itself. They were gifts that were put under that tree. And that is what spiritual gifts are like for us. God gives you spiritual gifts. You didn't earn them. You don't deserve them. They didn't come from you. They're gifts. They're not rewards. And they're meant for a purpose. They're a purpose for spiritual gifts. They're not ornaments to, to look at. They are gifts to be used. And they're gifts to be used to serve others in our lives, their gifts for service. And friends, we need more of the Holy Spirit to use the gifts that God has given us. Let me just ask you a question. When you look at your life from Monday through Saturday or Monday through Sunday, where is it in your life that you are serving other people? You're serving. You are giving out of your gifts, the gifts that God has given you toward others. Wherever that is, you need the Holy Spirit. 100% you need the Holy Spirit. And I wanna ask you to pray whenever you go into a place where you are serving, say, Holy Spirit, would you fill me? God, I need you to fill me. And friends, if you look at your life Monday, through Sunday and you say, you know, I don't actually see any place where I am serving. Then friends, let me invite you to pray, fill me Holy Spirit. Because if we are men out of the overflow of what God has poured into us to flow into the lives of others. That is the way it's meant to be. We serve not out of obligation, not because there's a need, not out of guilt, but because the Holy Spirit is filling us. And so we need to say, God, I have nothing to give, nothing apart from your Holy Spirit, would you fill me? And lastly, we need the Spirit to know that we're loved, that we're loved over and over again. We need to know that we're loved and the Spirit pours God's love into us. Romans says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us John Wimber, the founder of the vineyard, he said, we are like leaky buckets, leaky buckets. We get filled up with God's love, these leaky buckets, and we leak out and we need to come to God again and again and say, God, would you fill me again with your love? We need your love. And you heard about uh, the conference that we did a couple of weeks ago for our students. Friends, we want to be a church that prays for the Holy Spirit to fill this next generation in our church and in our city. We need them to know the love of God and the power of God. And at this conference, there were some wonderful stories of God's Spirit coming one of our leaders who was there said this, God physically felt very close and personal to me at the conference. I experienced the beauty of his humility and correction. I don't know that I've ever truly experienced that before. I think it was the first time I experienced correction from God without feeling the shame I put on myself. That's the Holy Spirit, friends. A high school student said, I've been feeling very concerned and worried about my future and calling and making friends. But when I went to receive prayer, I was calmed, reminded of my worth and how much God values me and has a good plan for my life. Amen. And an eighth grade student said, I experienced God the most through worship. I just felt in the zone and felt like he was giving me a warm hug. I love that, love that. Friends, we need to be filled with the Spirit. 
We need to be filled with the Spirit over and over again to become like Christ, to serve with his love and his power, and to know his love filling us over and over again. Amen? Amen. Let's be a church that prays for more of the Holy Spirit. Let's be people that pray for more of the Holy Spirit. Would you stand around our campuses here at Westerville? Would you stand? And let's, let's just welcome God's presence and let's wait for a moment on him. And uh, after just a moment, campus pastors are gonna come and lead you in ministry time. God bless you, have a wonderful week. Let's, let's just wait on God's presence. Come Holy Spirit, we welcome you Lord. Welcome you God. We want more of you Lord. We need more of you God. Come, Lord. Friends, as we're waiting, I just sense that the Holy Spirit, as the spirit of conviction, is just in his most loving and gracious way is coming and convicting us of our sin. And it is a mercy and a kindness when the Lord comes and convicts us of our sin. And I just want to encourage you just in your heart to just say, Lord, would you come and, and Lord, wherever you want to convict me, God, wherever I need your word of correction, God, I pray that, Lord, you would come. The Lord's kind. The Lord is kind. And I pray over and over again throughout the scriptures, whenever we see a new move of God, a new work of God, it comes and it begins with a conviction of sin. And I pray God for myself, I pray for our leaders, I pray for each one of us as a church, God, a conviction of sin over us, Lord, and Lord, just a deep knowledge of your mercy and your kindness, Lord, that leads us to repentance. Would you come, Lord, and increase your presence, and Lord, make us holy like you. Lord, you wanna make us uh, a sacrament to our city, uh, a sign of your presence in the lives of those around us. God, make us holy, fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. One of the things I sense the Spirit uh, doing to you is there are some of you who are saying, Lord, I want to serve. I just I want to know what my ministry is. I want to know, God, what you have for me. And you're looking for this place of deeper engagement through the Holy Spirit. And I just pray, if that's you, just around the room, that the Lord would just bless you and lead you and speak to you. He would show you where your place of service is. He would guide you. I pray divine appointments for you. I pray prophetic words and I pray just courage to step in to those places of a deeper sense of calling in your life where God is, he's beckoning you, he's calling you. For some of you, it's gonna take great courage and faith to step out and I just pray that the Lord would, would give you all that you need. I think Julia has a word here. Hmm. 
Yeah. I'll just stay. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Thank you. Tech guy. <laughs> Hit the rock. Um, I just also had a sense, I think we, are, we should pray for men, men who are called into leadership. And that looks a whole lot of different ways. I believe women and men are equally called into leadership, but I think that there's a special moment right now for us to pray for our brothers, many of whom feel a lot of pushback when they work towards uh, leading these days, but particularly men who are filled by the Spirit and men who are equipped by gifts of the Spirit. So. We, we're going to pray for a lot of different people, but I'm just going to encourage you, if you are a, a, a student, a guy, a kid, a man, a, a grown one or a little one, um, I want us to pray for you right now. And I'm going to encourage many of you to come up to the front. There are many of you who are like, that's not my gig, that's not what I do, that's all right, you do you. But there is something that happens in us when we take a step out and acknowledge to God, we need you. You need him to do the thing that he's called you to do as men in this world. Mm -hmm. You need him. And he wants to fill you by his spirit and demonstrate his love to you. And he also wants to equip you to go out and be the person that he's called you to be. So I'm not going to say if that applies to you because then you'll feel called out on the spot. But if you're here and you're willing to, and you're a young adult or a kid or a grown up, and you're a man, and you acknowledge your need for the Lord, would you come to the front? Let us just pray the power of God over you. Pray a filling of the Spirit. Come on. Just come, Lord. Just increase, Lord. You don't have to feel like, oh, I need, or oh, I'm not filled. You just, you just. And sisters, let's pray for our brothers. Mm. Lord, thank you for men who want to look like you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Just increase, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come, Lord. Jesus. Come. Bless, bless you for your sons, Lord. We bless you for these men, God. Those who are up front, those who are staying where they're seating, God. Would you fill by the power of your spirit, God? Would you fill them with your love, with your affirmation? Would you remind them who you've made them to be? Some of you guys might not feel like you need to get prayer, but especially my sages, my sort of older men, my grandfathers and great grandfathers, you want to come forward and bless these guys. Mm. Yes. We just bless you to be the men that God has called you to be. Hmm. So come on forward if you're on a prayer ministry team. or yes. You can keep coming forward if, if you're not kind of familiar with this space. God, we pray for godly authority. We pray for yes. godly power. Yes, Lord. We pray that you would well up in our brothers, Lord, Thank that you, Lord. you would well Thank up, you, Lord. Lord. Yes, Lord. Would you pour your spirit out in the name of Jesus? Come, Lord. Just come, Lord. If you're not used to getting prayer, you can close your eyes if you want to. You can open your hands. And if you're up here, you just say, Father, make me more like you. That's, all, that's the only prayer you got to pray. Father, make me more like you. I'm going to need some more folks to come up and pray. So if I can have some more people to come up and pray, that would be great. I want to pray for those of you who your tree is planted in a really difficult situation right now, and you know that you need the Holy Spirit to produce the fruit that looks like Christ. And I just wanna pray for you, if that's, you identify with that, and you're like, yes, I know a situation that God has planted me in right now, and it's really hard, mm -hmm. and I need more of the Holy Spirit. If you just open mm -hmm. your hands, mm -hmm. And I just pray, Spirit of God, that you would come mm -hmm. and Lord, you would fill yes. each person. I pray just the roots of your life to be nourished by the Holy Spirit, that, that your roots would grow deeper and deeper in Christ, in his power, in his life, in his transforming ability over you to allow you to, to show fruit in, your, in the situation in a way that would be a miracle. It would just be something that you would say, only God could do this. And I just pray, Spirit of God, that you would fill each person, each situation. You would meet each one, God, in this place of difficulty and challenge and hardship, God. Just come on. Just take another moment and, and um, 
Yeah, I just feel like as a, this is a, it's a unique seat that I sit in as a woman who is your senior pastor. And I just have a deep sense of wanting again to pray the blessing over the Lord, especially over our men. Mm-hmm. Especially those of you who are trying to be the kind of man that God has called you to be, the kind of father, the kind of brother, the kind of son. Thank you, Lord. I do pray that the Lord would, the picture in the scripture is of a tall tree planted by a swift stream that is deeply rooted, where your branches grow out and they become a home for all sorts of little creatures. And I pray. Thank you, Lord. That men in this congregation, you, that the Spirit of God would fill you, yes, Lord. that he would deepen your roots, that he would establish you, that he would give you the authority that he has over your life, that he would stretch you out, that you might be a home, a safe space for lots of people around you. So we bless you. We bless you. All right, let's. We're gonna have a couple more folks come up and receive prayer or offer prayer if you'd like to do that, and we're gonna end with a time of worship. Thanks for sticking around a little bit extra long. <laughs>